In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's turn to the passage we're going to consider this morning, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at uh, verse 8. First Peter 3, verses 8 to 22. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the, in the spirit after being made alive. He went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism, now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Well, YouTube has become a means by which uh, people are able to share all sorts of activities with people all over the world. Uh, It's changed the way people today can get an audience. So, for example, musicians, music artists can uh, not necessarily have to wait until they can secure that music deal uh, with a record label. They can put their work out there and sometimes it catches on and it spreads around the world and they get a hearing. Other people do something kind of interesting, unique, different, and then their video goes viral and it spreads everywhere and people share it all over the place. Lots of stuff is shared that, that people get up to. And uh, my kids are in that generation that's interested in YouTube stuff, especially some of my boys that like to see videos about all sorts of things that people try. Some of it's entertaining. Sometimes people get up to stuff that's a bit funny. Sometimes people get up to things that they're impressive. It's like that's, that's really amazing that they could do that. But one of the things you notice as you look at YouTube, you come across things that you just say, that's really not a good idea. Like, why would you do that? Uh, sometimes it's something that's dangerous. And you think, why would you risk your life like that? Uh, perhaps it's something that's just weird or a bit embarrassing, or it's, um, it's just doing something that's not according to the design of how something was supposed to be used. And you say, why would you do that? Well, increasingly, it's not on YouTube, but increasingly people are asking that about Christians and about following Jesus. Our, our society, our culture looks at us and they say, why would you do that? Why would you follow Jesus? Um, Why is it a good thing? Maybe that's in the place that you're at. Maybe you're here this morning, you're exploring, you're thinking about what it means to follow Jesus. You think, I don't know, why would I go that path? I'm not sure that it seems like such a good idea. Certainly many around us will say, I mean, hey, following Jesus, Christianity, it's outdated. It's 
It's a bit weird. It's, uh, it's about religion. It's about being restricted. Uh, it's, it's closed-minded. And our culture, we, we've moved on. We've progressed in our thought and so on. Why would you keep following this? And Peter's saying here in this passage before us, he's saying, I want you to know why this is a good thing. I want you to know why it's a good thing to be following Jesus. And I want you to be convicted enough that you're able to tell others why you follow Jesus. It's, it's got to be more than just, well, I like going to church. I mean, someone will come back to you and say, well, I like going to the football. Is that good enough? It's got to be more than just, you know, well, I just grew up with it. Like, he wants us to be convicted of why it's a good thing to follow Jesus and why we're so convinced we're going to tell others about it. What's more, it's the last Sunday of this year, 2020. We're on the verge of a new year. How is following Jesus going to help us to face the challenges of 2021? Actually, how is it going to help us to respond to 2021, whether it's got challenges or not, whether it turns out well or whether it doesn't? Because Peter deals with both sides, the good and the not so good. He addresses both. And his key point is that centering our life around Jesus is the key. Peter's been addressing uh, the difference that the gospel of Jesus makes uh, in different relationships. He talks about husbands and wives, talks about slaves to their masters and so on. And now he comes kind of wrapping that up a little bit, uh, sort of to talk generally, uh, particularly about relationships within the church. But he says, uh, verse 8 and 9, be like-minded, be sympathetic, uh, love one another, be compassionate, be humble. It's like general principles of how we should relate to each other. And that kind of life stands out. It stands out because it's not particularly common, is it? It's often not how people actually treat each other with sympathy and with a love for one another and a commitment to one another and compassion and humility. It stands out. But we've got that question still. Why? Why would we live like that? Why not stand up for yourself? Why not get your own back if someone wrongs you? Why act like this? But the second part of verse 9, he says, rather than repaying evil with evil, repay evil with blessing. Why? Because to this you were called that you might inherit a blessing. It's, it's actually a good way, it, like it, it leads to good things. Because there are benefits to a life lived for Jesus. And that's what Peter's going to unpack for us. There's benefits to a life lived for Jesus in both the good situations and the bad situations, as we'll see. Living the godly, grace-transformed, Jesus-centered life is advantageous. But it's not to say it will always be easy, as we'll explore. But it is advantageous that the, the Godly, grace-transformed, Jesus-centered life is advantageous. And that's essentially what he expresses in, in verse 10 to 12, which is a quote from Psalm 34. Whoever would love life, whoever would see good days, must keep their tongue from evil, must pursue this godly path, their lips from deceitful speech. Turn from evil, do good. The godly life generally pays off because God's the creator and, and to be things go best when we're aligned with his purposes. And so we see there in verse 12 that, the, that God is watching. He's watching the righteous. He's watching the unrighteous. And, and so therefore, verse 13, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? I mean, that's the usual pattern. Who's going to cause grief if you're committed to doing good, the usual pattern is that things will work out. And that's, by and large, the message of Proverbs. Proverbs is a book in the middle of the Bible that uh, gives a whole pile of sayings about life, kind of general principles. This is normally the way it works. And so often it's if you pursue evil, if you um, cause trouble with people, things are going to go badly for you. But if you pursue what is right and what is good, then that's a better path. That's, that's kind of the, the essential message. So let's consider a few examples of how that plays out. That God's way is a, is a better way. And so the verses 8 and 9, this idea of relationships, of being sympathetic, loving, caring, compassionate, humble, 
Don't repay evil with more evil. That generally works out better when we follow this compared to if we approach our relationships in a way that's selfish and we approach our relationships in a way that just tries to get on top of each other, like come over. It, it, it usually works out better when we're harmonious, when we're serving others rather than serving ourselves. Another situation is just thinking about how when we act in a way that kind of manipulates a situation or manipulates people so as to get control, so as to seek what we want, so as to get an advantage, to, to, to make it work out. And when we do that, which we're all a bit prone to, some people characterise by it, some of us just do it from time to time, but it might seem to work out for a time. We might actually get our way. We might manage to achieve what we were aiming for. But so often in the long run, it leads to heartache. It leads to pain. It, 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 we find ourselves dealing with broken relationships that really we've caused because we tried to manipulate, to try and get control. We find ourselves that there are people start to avoid dealing with us because we're not very nice to deal with because we've tried to control and we've tried to manipulate. We find ourselves lonely. We bear the fruits of our, of our actions. So one of the, the Proverbs... Um, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27 says, Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Whoever rolls a stone, it will roll back on them. It's the idea of you, can't, you reap what you sow. If, if you're someone who digs a pit to try and catch someone out, chances are you're going to fall in the pit that you dug for somebody else. You try and roll a stone up to try and cause trouble, it's probably going to roll back down on you. So often, what we think we're doing to, to get an advantage comes back to bite us. Another example, and it's a key example, is the, the issue of the, the, the sexual revolution, and, and we still bear the fruits of that because we're kind of still headed in that direction. It's a very key example of what I'm getting at here because it's really an issue where our culture clashes with Christian values. And you see what God is portraying in one hand and what our culture is saying on the other, and they really come to a, to a head there. Because you know, there's the perception that Christian ideas about sexuality and so on are bad. And that people kind of say, why would you adhere to them? Why would you go that way? You see, the drive behind the, the, the sexual revolution was the, the idea for more freedom, freedom for more pleasure, freedom for more excitement. Uh, we want to pursue that. And so we see in magazines, we see in movies portrayed over and over again that the idea of sort of casual sexual relationships with many, many people is kind of the ideal. The, better, the more you can achieve that, the better off you are. And if you speak against that from the Bible, if you come and say, no, actually, God's got a different plan. People are going to look at you and go, what? What planet are you from? Like, that's just so nonsense. Uh, you must be just prudish. You must be kind of anti-pleasure, anti-fun. You're just trying to shut people down, follow this religious nonsense. It's just about causing people to avoid what's good. That's the mindset. Why would you go that way? And that's what we've got to kind of grapple with. If we're going to say, look, following Jesus is best, we've got to be able to answer that. Because they're saying, no, it doesn't look best. But to say that sort of God by his standards is somehow anti-sex is a bit sort of dubious. I mean, he created it in the first place. And his plan is a better story. And how is it a better story? There's a lady named Patricia Wirakun. She worked for, throughout her career as a, a sexologist, studying the, the issues to do with um, sex and sexual relationships and so on, and, and serving in a practice in that. She's retired now uh, from her official work, but she goes around, she's written a number of books, and she goes around from, through different schools and different churches talking to young people about the issues. It's such a big issue in our, in our culture. And one of the things she highlights is that the way that the sexual relationship bonds people together. There's a hormone in us that kicks off in sexual encounters, also in breastfeeding and in childbirth, called oxytocin. It's actually called the cuddle hormone because it creates this bond between people. And what she points out is that you create this bond through a casual sexual encounter and then every time you break it off, it hurts. And you make the bond and then you break it and you make the bond and then you break it. You're actually hurting yourself in the process. And not only do you hurt yourself, but the, the, the bond actually weakens. The ability of this process, which God intended, 
to bond people together actually becomes weaker and weaker. You know that marvellous stuff called Velcro? You know, you've got the hooks and you've got the loops and you stick it together and you pull it. It's really helpful. But over time, what happens? Eventually, the loops kind of become a bit matted and de de deteriorate and whatever, and Velcro no longer sticks as well as it did. And that's kind of what happens through these casual sexual encounters. The bond is weakened. The ability of what it was intended for doesn't happen anymore. Okay, but Patricia Weira Coons a, a Christian and she's, maybe she's biased. But I saw the same thing expressed basically by a secular um, person in the same field, uh, writing for the ABC. And she was interacting with the concept of friends with benefits relationships. You know, where friends with benefits is where people just, they have a, a sexual relationship with just friends. So they kind of get the benefits of the sort of thrill of their sexual encounter, but you don't have all the complications of, uh, of a long-term romantic relationship. And so she's exploring that idea. And one of the things she highlights, she says, if you're going to have this kind of friends with benefits notion... You've got to beware of oxytocin, the cuddle hormone. Don't allow it to bond because you're going to get hurt. She's basically kind of saying, you've got to work against that. You've got to not get hurt by allowing it to do its thing, which is a little bit backwards, isn't it? Admittedly, she does say at the end of her article, she, she, she basically concludes, she says, consider a lot of the things that people want from a friends with benefits kind of relationship are actually the rewards that are reaped from relationships where people put in the hard yards and work at things. She says, I wonder what we're really hoping for. I'll tell you what we're really hoping for. We're hoping for God's design, for God's intent of what he was, uh, had in mind with the sexual relationship. We're just inclined to think that we know better. We do it our way and we reap all sorts of results from that. So the path that God sets out for us is a better path. We need to, Peter wants us to know that. If you would love life, if you would see good days, then follow this path. Turn from evil, seek to do good and pursue it. And for that, of course, we need Jesus. We can't do it on our own. It's not like, well, if you're going to just fix up your life and pursue the better path, it'll all be okay. No, we need Jesus. And we'll delve into that a little bit more later. But what we've seen so far is following Jesus is not just a renunciation. It's not just a denial of what is good. It's not just giving up what is good and what is enjoyable. It is the better path. God's way is the better story. But that's not the whole story. We've got to verse 13. And then verse 14, he says, okay, God's way is the better story, but that doesn't mean that everything's always going to turn out positively. And so verse 14, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. He says, yep, okay, God's journey, God's path is better, but there will be times when you will suffer hardship even when you do what is right. As a matter of fact, there'll be times when you suffer hardship because you have done what is right. We're not in heaven yet, friends. We live in a, in a world that is fallen where people act in selfish ways, where people act in hurtful ways, and we're inclined to act in selfish ways, we're inclined to act towards others in hurtful ways. We're going to experience that. So how do we respond? What do we make of that situation? How are we going to endure? Peter points out, if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. There is still blessing, even in the hardship. What, how, what does that look like? How are we blessed by hardship? How do we face it? Well, basically, his point is by focusing, continuing to focus on doing what is right. By continuing to focus on trusting in Jesus and his way. And the key there is in verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's the key. If you get only one thing out of today, that's the goal. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's what we're going to keep focusing on. That's, that's the goal. But what does that look like? What does it mean to revere Christ as Lord? 
There's a movie, uh, it goes by the name of 42. It tells the story of Jackie Robinson, who was the first black American baseball player in the Major League Baseball. And so it tells the story of the challenges and the vitriol and the difficulties he had to go through to pioneer that path to enable black players to play in the American Baseball League. And so he, yeah, he atta- got received attacks from other players. He had, he, they got denied entry at certain hotels because, no, we don't want you here. Uh, all sorts of challenges that he went through. And at one point, he'd been uh, playing on the field and, and one of the other players actually deliberately uh, s- spiked him with their shoe, the spikes on their shoe, and injured him, but made it sort of made out like as if it was just an accident. And, uh, and the coach, sorry, the team manager who'd been trying to walk with Jackie Robinson through this journey, he comes up to him, he says, you know what I saw this morning? I saw a little white boy lining up at the pitch to take a ball. And he was rubbing dirt on his hands and he was swinging the bat with outstretched arms. He said he was pretending to be you. Imagine that, a little white boy pretending to be a black ball player. What's the manager doing? He's saying, Jackie Robinson, look at the big picture. Look look where we're heading. Lift your eyes out of the challenges and focus on that. And as we say, we're going to revere Christ as Lord. We're not just looking at the challenges of um, interracial relationships. We're lifting our eyes to something even bigger. Look at Jesus. Revere Christ as Lord. That gives you a bigger picture. That gives you a bigger purpose. Revering Christ as Lord is that bigger picture. How do we do that? Three, three ways we can revere Christ as Lord. First of all, honouring him with obedience, even when it costs. First way is that if we revere Christ as Lord by honouring him with our obedience, even when it costs. So I've been, slandered, I've been hurt by someone and I could, I feel like, Getting back at them, I'll slander them, I'll tell people about what they've done, but no, I'm going to honour Christ as Lord. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to respond differently. Or I've got the opportunity to do a bit better financially if I kind of twist the, the books a little bit or avoid this tax that I can get out of, but I should really pay. No, I'm going to honour Christ as Lord and I'm going to do what's right. Or perhaps I'm very concerned about my image and, and what I, my appearance or what people are going to think. But no, I'm going to recognize that that's not the most important thing. I'm going to honor Christ as Lord, even if it costs me my reputation. And we do that waiting for him to vindicate us. That's verse 16. When things get out of, get out of place, we keep a clear conscience. So that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That that shame, that that vindication might come in this life. Sometimes it does. They look at your life or or someone else backs you up and they end up being the ones with egg on their face. Sometimes it won't come until the end. When Jesus comes back and says, I'm going to put everything right, I'm going to square it all up and you'll be vindicated. We have to wait for that. So we revere Christ as Lord by honouring him with obedience, even when it, when it costs. The second way in which we can revere Christ as Lord is by letting Christ examine us, by letting him say what he needs to say. See, the key to pursuing, key to persevering in obedience to Christ is to, to work with conviction and with, um, with confidence But it's possible and it's all too common even that we can be confident and convicted about the wrong things. We've actually got things out of of place, but we're driving for it with with conviction and and, and confidence. And so, I mean, just think about it. The people that Jesus had the most issue with throughout his ministry were religious people. People who are absolutely convinced they are on the right path and they would not submit to Jesus. They would not honour him as Lord. And so we need to, um, if we're going to revere Christ as Lord, we're going to say, do I need correcting? Lord Jesus, I'm going to humbly seek you. I'm going to, I want you to reveal to me if there's something that I've got wrong. So we honour Christ by obedience even when it costs. We let him examine us and we revere Christ as Lord. Thirdly, by knowing that we can't do this ourselves. 
I mean, I don't know how you felt as you read through this, about keeping a clear conscience, about responding without revenge, about um, just trusting. I don't know if you thought, yeah, I can do that. No worries. I don't feel I can do that. If I'm really honest with myself and I look at how I respond to situations, I have to say, I can't do this. And that's the key to what it means to revere Christ as Lord. To say, Lord, I can't do this. I can't be this kind of person. I need you to help me to be this kind of person. We need grace from Jesus. And that's part of what it means to revere him as Lord. He's the king. He's the one who gives me what I need. Not that it comes from myself. So we honor him by seeking that. And as we honour Jesus as Lord, we're ready to give a defence, verse 15, that um, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. Know the reason that you trust in Jesus. And this is key to our confidence. We're going to stand firm. We're going to say, I'm going to commit to following Jesus. I'm going to honour him as Lord. We have to know why. We have to be convinced in ourselves as to why. And here I'm referring not just to the story of of the cross. That's an important story and it's really helpful for you to think about how can I convey that to someone? Can I learn something that enables me to tell them about the message of the cross? That is helpful. But it's not really enough. It's not just the story, it's your story. Why does the story actually matter to you? What has God done in your life? What is, how has God shown you that you need the cross? That's your story. You've got to be able to tell people with conviction. You've got to know it yourself with conviction. Why will I stand to follow Jesus? Because I need him. And that's essentially what, what David has done. The psalm 34 is a psalm that David wrote, and it's quoted there, just a little bit of it. But Psalm 34 is essentially David telling his story. He's saying, this is why I follow the Lord. And verse Uh, Verse 4, he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And verse 6, he says, this poor man, talking about himself, this poor man called out to the Lord and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. And he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. This is put David's story. He's saying, God is good. I've experienced that God is good and I want you to experience the same thing. That's the defense for why David is committed to following Jesus. Uh, well, not, he didn't know, understand he was following Jesus because it was before that time, but that's the eventual fulfillment of it. And even as we do that, even as we tell our story, we do it keeping a clear conscience. We, we tell our story with integrity, not twisting it, not distorting things, trying to win people over or win an argument. But he, he says, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience conscience and then peter moves to point us to two different examples example of jesus the example of noah to make his point that he's getting over how do we follow how do we revere christ as lord and how does that make the difference and the first example is jesus in verse 18 for christ also suffered for sins suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Don't expect a, a smooth ride if you manage to live a righteous life because Jesus didn't. He was the most righteous person who ever lived and he didn't get a smooth ride. This is how he can be our substitute because he was perfectly righteous. And so he can substitute for us who, who are not. We're called to follow him and that was his path. Though he was righteous, he was rejected He suffered. And obedience to God's will for him meant a road of suffering. Not a road that was easy. Not a road that just led to people commending him. That's the example of Jesus. And secondly, the example of Noah. Noah of, you know, flood fame. If you're not so familiar with the Bible, Noah's the guy who um, God sent a flood and he, he built an ark to escape that flood. 
And that's dealt with in verse 19 and 20. There's, I don't know, as you read through, you sort of think, oh, what's going on here? Or maybe you've looked at this passage a little bit before. There's lots that's complicated here in terms of what he refers to about uh, Noah, in terms of Jesus going and speaking to the spirits in prison and what it means that he preached to them and whatever. We haven't got time to try and grapple with all that. I haven't even fully managed to kind of get my head entirely around it. It doesn't matter for, for this morning. Uh, the, the key thing is... Noah was on the right path. He was acting in obedience to God and the people around him were on the wrong path. And so there was this sort of opposition, Noah versus everyone else, pretty much everyone else. He was on the right path and he faced the hostility, the opposition of those who weren't on the right path. And as he built the ark, which took a period of 120 years that God gave him to build this ark because it wasn't just a little bathtub like we see in the picture books that make the whole story out to be a joke or a fairy tale. It was a massive thing that was going to hold the animals and he took 120 years to build it. And as he's building it, both in the act of building it and the conversations he no doubt had as he was building, people going, what on earth are you building this thing for? People had opportunity to respond. God is sending judgment. And so that's verse 20 that God waited patiently in the days of Noah, giving people an opportunity to respond. But in the end, Noah was vindicated. Because the flood did come and Noah was seen to be right. Obedience was the better path. Likewise, when we trust in Jesus, which is symbolized in baptism, is where the story of Noah goes, the water, Peter makes this connection to, towards baptism, and he says, well, it's not really about the physical washing, it's about what the baptism represents. That's what we thought about last week as we shared in a baptism. It's about what the symbol points to. It's about faith in Jesus. Jesus, who, verse 21 and 22, he saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that his work was finished, and therefore he was ascended to glory and power and to sit at God's right hand. That's what our hope is in. Jesus, the one who, though he was righteous, died for the unrighteous, which is all of us. In his obedience, he followed that path. And verse 22, he was vindicated by God. He followed the path of obedience and he was vindicated. And that gives us hope of our vindication. How do we pursue the path of obedience to Jesus? How are we going to persist honoring him as Lord? Knowing that one day we'll be vindicated if we're on the right path because Jesus is the King. Amen. He's he's, he's the king. And if we trust in that king, then we have the hope of vindication. If we persevere with what is right, it is the better path. We'll see aspects of that better path now. Certain aspects of our life will turn out better. If we're on that path, there will be blessing now, but not always now. Some of it waits until then. Some aspects of that better path come later. As we put our hope in him, as we revere Christ as Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this hope of, of vindication, not because fundamentally of who we are, but because of where we put our trust, that we put our trust in Jesus, Lord, in what you have done, that that Jesus the righteous one paid the penalty for our unrighteousness. And now he's, because of his obedience to you, he's glorified and stands with you in heaven and rules over all things. And so as we trust in you, we have that hope of being united with him, of standing with him, of being vindicated in him. Lord, help us to see your better path. Help us to recognize the, way that it pl- the ways that it plays out in our life here and now such that we'll follow it and we'll pursue it with conviction and that that would rub off, that that would um, be evident to others, that we would be able to tell that to others and people would see it. But Lord, help us to trust in Jesus. It's not easy. It's not an easy road and you know that. Jesus himself followed that difficult road. At times that brought him to great anguish at the, the cost of following that difficult road. So Lord, help us 
to follow. Give us your grace to follow that challenging road of obedience to you in the hope that one day all will be put right. We'll see it truly is the better path. In Jesus' name, amen.